Pride will be celebrated this month with parades and lots of other very public celebrations. That's taken a lot of hard work by advocates over long decades. It might also be thanks in small part to a hidden but enduring way that members of the community have found each other. It's the subject of human rights lawyer Marcus McCann's new book. It's called Park Cruising, What Happens When We Wander Off the Path? And he joins us now. Welcome to our studio. Thank you for having me. All right, so for, I'm gonna be honest, when I was talking to people, hey, I'm doing uh, an interview about cruising, people thought boats, people thought bodies of water. Sure. What exactly is park cruising? Cruising is a way of um, making connections between people. It uses kind of non-verbal and uh, eye contact uh, as a way of signaling essentially sexual availability. And so the best comp that I have would be People might say, we noticed each other from across the bar. And that's very different than he crowded into my personal space and uh, tried to buy me a drink even though I didn't want to. And so that, that um, difference, which is like maybe intuitive, is really about kind of a circuit of watching for cues of sexual interest, mutual interest. Mm -hmm. That's what cruising is. That can happen anywhere. It can happen in a bar. And it certainly happens in parks all over the province. All right. One of the questions that a lot of people probably are asking, is it legal? I know it's, a, it's sort of a, a nuanced question, uh, but how do we tackle that? Yeah, uh, the way that cruising is practiced by most people most of the time, there's nothing unlawful about it. There, um, if you're talking about meeting somebody in a park, uh, meeting a stranger, arranging a, an encounter, there's nothing unlawful about that. Um, the, in the, under the criminal code, under, under the um, public indecency provisions, um, you can run into a problem if you're doing it in front of other people who are like non-participants or people who don't want to, to observe it. All right. Um, let's get an idea of um, putting this in, in, in context. In Ontario here, how long uh, do you think cruising has been happening in parks just in this province alone? Uh, park cruising has a long history in Ontario, and we have that history primarily through court records and from um, shocked newspaper accounts. Hmm. So 100 years ago, people were cruising in Allen Gardens, for example, in Toronto and at Queen's Park, and um, in the, the alleyways in the ward where the Eaton Centre is now. Okay. Um, and so people would get arrested. There would be these sort of sensationalistic newspaper accounts and it would feed the circuit because then people would read the newspaper and be like, oh, that sounds interesting, I should go check it out. Hmm, okay. Is, in, in terms of parks, how did it become a place gay men went for intimacy? In, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, when we have our earliest records of park cruising in Toronto, um, Toronto was a, a city that was really rapidly evolving. There were um, tenement houses that were overcrowded. People didn't have kind of private, intimate spaces where they could do these kinds of activities. So people began to meet each other in the streets and laneways in the parks. Um, also around that time, there was the social purity movement that was uh, trying to engage in public reform to have a more kind of like a Victorian or kind of like <laughs> upright public appearance, which included the erection of many public bathrooms okay. for the first time in Toronto. And those immediately had the opposite of effect uh, and, and turned into places where men began to meet each other for various kinds of intimacies. Okay. Um, things have changed. When we talk about sure. 100 years ago to now in terms of where uh, the progress has made in, in queer spaces and in queer community, obviously a lot of work still needs to be done. But is park cruising gaining or losing popularity? I mean, it's hard to tell. There's not, there's no one at the edge of the bushes with a clicker, <laughs> like at a bar saying, um, you know, counting attendance or capacity. What we do know is that in, um, over the last 25 years, there's been a lot of pressure on the kind of private commercial sex on premises sites like bathhouses and back rooms in, in bars that um, those have been in decline. And so places, uh, public spaces where, where people could meet for sexual activity, um, there's fewer of them than there used to be. At the same time, there's like a kind of intense pressure on uh, residential housing in Toronto, but now all over the province, where um, 
single, the, the sort of idea of single people living alone in apartments where they could um, host is a bit of a fantasy when commercial or residential rents are so high. I want to bring up the, the commercial spaces, and I'm also mm -hmm. going to um, ask a question in terms of a, a little bit of a rebuttal. You know, there are apps nowadays. Yeah. There are, you know, social spaces, like you talked about the bars, the gay bars that, you know, people can meet, other queer spaces. There are the bathhouses. Shouldn't parks be off limits for intimacy because there are those spaces? Or sort of help me understand that. Why does that space need to exist if those spaces do? Yeah, I think people that have that objection misunderstand the way that park cruising happens most of the time. Park cruising, if there's any kind of intimacies that are happening on site, they tend to happen behind the bushes or in disused parts of the forest or in abandoned warehouses, places where non-participants are unlikely to stumble upon it. And so the idea that the, this use is, some, is somehow um, hampering other people's enjoyment of the park is just not true. I, I think of parks as being mixed use spaces where lots of different types of activities happen and they happen at different times of the day um, and you know in the context of that geography. So uh, in the book I describe how you know it would uh, park planning and infrastructure is designed to allow for these mixed use spaces to to coexist. Mm -hmm. So there'll be um, park benches with garbages, and a restroom for people who are picnicking. And then elsewhere in the park, there'll be a place for playing badminton. And you don't, you don't need uh, like an official prohibition or a law. People just know that playing badminton over the uh, picnic tables would be unwelcome, right. or as would picnicking under the, the, the badminton nets. <laughs> All right, um, I should mention, you know, we know park cruising can be a controversial topic, and um, even among queer communities as well. Uh, what are some queer folks, why would some queer folks and communities be unsupportive of park cruising? There has never been a complete consensus on park cruising. It's always been controversial, part of a handful of topics, along with pornography and BDSM and um, other subjects where um, the kind of rights-based uh, assimilationist or um, we would have said assimilation is 25 years ago. Right. But uh, the, uh, the kinds of cultures of respectability that some queer people think are important are threatened by the realities of park cruising. However, park cruising isn't going away. And so it's important for people who are doing that work or thinking through these issues to incorporate park cruising into their into their worldviews. You say park cruising isn't going away. I do have a quote uh, that I want to pull up uh, from your from your book that talks about the persistence of park cruising uh, for queer communities. You write, nobody should be surprised that men continue to cruise during the pandemic. We cruise through winter. We cruise through the police raids. We cruise through the AIDS crisis. Reagan is dead, and we are still cruising. Uh, very powerful quote there. I, I do want to pick up on the COVID part. Uh, yeah. How did COVID affect park cruising? Because, you know, six feet apart, that was, you know, the, the mandate that was sort of given to all of Canadians to, to stay safe. But obviously, that was still going on. How did that affect park cruising? Within a few months of, uh, the, of COVID being declared a global pandemic, there was public health guidance coming out about how queer communities should engage in sexual activity. And uh, it started with uh, some New York guidance. There was some guidance out of BC that encouraged people to stay home, uh, have sex with partners in their own household, if they're going to engage in, in these kinds of activities to um, do things like uh, wear a mask and stay six feet apart. For people who are engaged in park cruising, the idea that there would be physical space between participants or the fact that you might need, have an extra degree of anonymity by wearing a mask, mm. uh, neither of those were really barriers to, to their, their continued cruising, essentially. And ultimately, people who are meeting for sex in outdoor spaces where they're well ventilated, there's you know millions of cubic feet of clean air, uh, that's probably a safer activity right. than doing it in, in, uh, at home in somebody's bedroom. Uh, I, I think with COVID, there was a lot of um, people who were doing rule breaking, but doing it behind closed doors. And so it was people who had the means to have that kind of privacy 
we're, we're doing the rule breaking with impunity. And other people, especially people who are maybe from poor working class communities who don't have the luxury of a big suburban backyard, um, were forced to, to figure out how to engage with their communities in ways that were, were more public and were more surveillable. All right, let's uh, change gears a little bit. Let's talk about police. Uh, you write that there's an unbroken line of police crackdowns on park cruising dating back at least 100 years. Uh, what are some Ontario-based examples? Uh, yes, park cruising uh, has been the site of you know, sort of periodic police interest over many, many decades. In my hometown of Hamilton, there was a um, high-profile sting of cruising at uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens, for example. There's the Aurelia Opera House case. Um, I came to this story through um, the raids that happened at Marie Curtis Park in Etobicoke in 2016, but uh, there's nothing inherently um, different about that raid. It's part of a, certainly a, a sequence. The, the best data that we have is actually from Quebec, where um, through freedom of information requests, we know that between 2007 and 2017, there were at least 300 cruising stings that resulted in arrests of men for this kind of activity. All right, uh, you talked about uh, Marie Curtis Park, uh, it was dubbed Project Marie. Tell us a little bit about that. Obviously, 72 plus men were caught. Um, you, you mentioned that this, this project uh, in terms of uh, the, the police raid itself, not that much different um, from the years previous, but 2016, not that long ago, you did sure. a lot of the legal defense uh, for the men that were caught. Um, they were given a bylaw ticket infraction for that. How did the lawsuits play out? How did this actual project, because some people might be surprised that, uh, you, you know, you made the comment that some, you know, someone's not really sitting at the side of a bush clicking how many people are going there. But in this case, there was actually someone doing that. Yeah, it, in, um, in Marie Curtis Park in Etobicoke, uh, there was um, in particular one police officer who was, it seems, pretty obsessed with the park cruising that was going on there. And so would go in plain clothes and wait to be solicited by men hmm. and then give them tickets for uh, sexual activity in the park. The police would also go late at night to the parking lot and block off the parking lot with a police cruiser and give everyone a ticket for, essentially for trespassing because uh, the parks are closed between midnight and 5.30 in Toronto. Closed, I, I mean, that's nominally closed, obviously. The, there's no uh, fencing that goes up right. or anything like that. So when we got word of that, a group of lawyers, including myself, organized through the law, the law Union of Ontario listserv to organize legal defenses for, for those who were affected by it. Uh, in the end, everyone who contacted us and decided to fight had those charges withdrawn, uh, although it took uh, eight or 10 months to do so. Why did it, it take so long? Um, partly it's just that legal processes take a long time. <laughs> they always happen, unfold more slowly than, than what one wants. Part of it was that, of course, we weren't provided with a list of everybody who was affected. Right. And so we were trying to, to uh, reach out to people through the media to get them to contact us. That's, that was its own process. In the end, what uh, seemed to be decisive was the question of disclosure. If we thought that it was a discriminatory, kind of targeted policing, waste of resources to engage in this um, sting, then we needed, as part of our disclosure, the evidence of who approved it, how much it cost, how many staffing hours went into the project. And it appears that the police weren't interested in providing that. And that became the basis, that became the point of tension that led to the charges being withdrawn. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about city planning. I found this quite interesting and I think a lot of people don't think about how there are sort of, the ways that our, our, our parks are sort of planned. You, you talked about parks being closed. I think a lot of people would not understand that, what, what do you mean there are no literal fences on these parks? Yeah. Why are they closed from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m.? But there are other ways, for example, the city of Toronto has tried to combat cruising that don't necessarily have to do with policing. You talked a little bit about, about that, but with this project and this park in particular, walk us through some, some examples of what, uh, what they're trying to do, essentially, in terms of pushing, uh, you know, park cruisers to the outskirts. 
Yeah, I will say about the park closure, it's part of a long tradition right. of anti-vagrancy provisions that target people who are homeless, people who use drugs, people who don't have anywhere else to go. So combine the park closure bylaw with the Eventually. Safer Streets Act that um, prohibits a lot of types of activities on city streets, and people are basically criminalized for existing at night without a house. Putting that aside, the um, park planners use a variety of tools to um, to combat park cruising that are not policing. The classic one is to cut out the underbush in a, in a traditional park mm. and to put up um, fluorescent lighting at night. So that has the effect of removing the places where men would go to have more kind of private liaisons. Unfortunately, the effect is to put their activity more on display so it can be, in some cases, quite counterproductive. Uh, in bathroom cruising, um, people, for example, have for a long time used the creaking of the door when the door is going to open so that people know to pull apart and to stop so that nobody sees anything that they're not supposed to see. But um, uh, bathroom renovations have increasingly uh, changed from a door to the kind of like envelope or Z entrance, right. which then means that there's no uh, audio cue for men to pull apart and it leaves them more likely to be exposed and for people to have unwitting confrontations that they don't want to have. All right. You write that stories of Park's things are not burned in our collective memories the way that bathhouse raids are, such as the ones, of course, that took place in 1981. That was dubbed Operation Soap. That was target on four bathhouses. And then, of course, the lesbian bathhouse, the Pussy Palace in 2000. Why do you think that's the case? It's an interesting question. The Bathhouse raids were mass arrests that took place over the course of, in the, in the case of the 1981 bathhouse raid, one night in February of 1981. Whereas with a park cruising sting or a bathroom cruising sting, people tend to be picked off one at a time. And so their experiences of being arrested or being at the police station are ones of extreme isolation. So it tends to amp up feelings of shame and sort of self um, uh, self-hatred and uh, tamp down on the things that would be the kind of sources of solidarity. I think when you look at the various bar raids that have taken place, whether it's um, the sex, sex garage raid at, in Montreal or um, at the Bijou, for example, in, in Toronto, that those became also sites of resistance because there was a kind of natural figurehead, the people who were the organizers of the event. Mm. And so the combination of having that solidarity across people who are affected, plus having people who have a strong interest in opposing it, mean that very often they get a different treatment than park cruising stings. You are obviously on the, the legal side of, of a lot of this stuff, and you see sort of the language uh, that you have to deal with. And it's something, a question that you pose in the book um, is, what would law look like if there was a positive attitude towards sex? Break that, break that down a little bit. You use examples of sort of sex workers uh, and sort of the fight that they've had to sort of endure and deal with in, in the court system. But the language part of that, what do you mean? Yeah, the, the law tends to see uh, any kind of sexual activity only through a lens of risk, problem, danger. Um, it's not something where the courts have regularly seen or identify the positive values that can come from sexuality. And by that I'm talking about sort of personal autonomy, um, flourishing, equality, the like um, self-expression. Uh, not that sex is always that way for everybody, mm -hmm. but it's basically never described that way in right. court documents. If we were to have that uh, kind of counterweight applied in legal scenarios, it wouldn't mean that there are no circumstances where the government has the leeway or a good reason to regulate sexuality. It would just mean that we would have to be more careful, that we would be analyzing pros and cons in a way, um, that um, there would be, an, uh, I, I would hope, some kind of reluctance to regulate sexuality other than in cases where there was a clear harm or a risk. You make the case that park cruising teaches people good lessons about sexual consent. How so? Yes. Uh, I mean, this is going to sound like a low bar, but um, the requirements of, of cruising are that people pay attention to the cues of 
what the other person is is thinking and feeling. So they're looking at body language, they're looking at eye contact, they're looking at other kinds of nonverbal cues. And in so doing, they're, what they're looking for is uh, indications of mutual interest. And I, I think that is a real baseline mm -hmm. for, for establishing sexual consent. And unfortunately, we see too many examples of people who sort of plow over consent, who are not, doesn't seem like they're, they're capable or interested in receiving information about how their advances are being um, received by the by the other party, and so it, to that extent, it um, when you're in an extreme situation like park cruising, it requires a kind of extreme attentiveness, and I think that is something that could be um, sort of a helpful lesson for people when they're thinking about how to navigate consent in other maybe less extreme situations. All right, uh, we have a couple minutes left. I have a couple two more questions for you. Uh, there's a horrible history of gay men in Canada being murdered in parks uh, or That's cruising right. areas that you talk about in your book. Um, you write that there has never been a police project in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, or Burnaby aimed at keeping the men in, who cruise in parks safe. If, police, if more policing is not the answer, what is? There's a long history of queer people doing their own safety projects. So in San Francisco, for example, in the 70s, there was the Butterfly Brigade, where they distributed whistles and uh, clipboards, and people would go and stand on the street corner at night and record the license plates of people who were throwing beer bottles mm. at uh, people in the Castro. And those, we have evidence that those um, uh, Butterfly Brigades also were in the parks keeping park cruisers mm. safe. There's something inherent in the infrastructure of park cruising, which is the presence of other people is a protective factor. And I should say, not just for park cruisers. When we were um, doing Project Marie, opposing Project Marie, we heard from community members who said, you know, I walk my dog late at night in Marie Curtis Park, and the presence of people who are, um, you know, sort of minding their own business, doing their own thing, is something that makes me feel safer. It's a very kind of Jane Jacobs uh, <laughs> eyes on the street. Okay. And so uh, we've seen this in various cities. So for example, in Ottawa, after the murder of Ellen Brosseau in 1989, there was a real turn toward this kind of community-based policing at the same time as there were efforts for police reform. So both of those were happening in tandem. I think it's important for people who don't know about that, that case. Do you mind sharing a few details with that? Yeah. Um, in uh, Majors Hill Park in Ottawa, over the course of that summer, there were a number of men who mysteriously fell off the side of the cliff toward the Ottawa River, and um, including two who had died earlier in the summer. But uh, in August of 1989, um, a, uh, a waiter in Ottawa who just got off his shift, Alain Bousseau, was walking home toward Gatineau when he was um, caught by a group of gay bashers, uh, beaten up, and eventually thrown over the side of the bridge where he died. And that, it was just such a horrific um, incident that it spurred that community to do um, police reform work that lasted more than a decade. It became one of the sort of foundational coalescing moments for that community. All right. Uh, my last question to you. There are probably people who are watching or listening to this program and may not have the opportunity to read your book, but still say park cruising isn't something that I necessarily want to see when I'm going out for my walk. It's not necessarily something I want to uh, be witness to if I'm at a picnic at a park with my family or something. What is the message to them to understand sort of the importance of what, park and cru what park cruising is to the queer community? If you're afraid about public displays of sexuality, then park cruising the way that it's actually practiced should actually be a comfort for you because it tends to happen in places w that are quite far away from um, uh, places where other people are using the park. So behind the bushes, in a, in a for part of a forest, on the other side of a fence, that kind of thing. Also in places that are busier parks, they tend to mostly happen late at night. And um, there are lots of uh, examples of where there's a risk of being caught or being seen where the men will actually pull apart and stop. So there was a, in the 1990s, there was a, a raid at the Village Mall in St. John's, Newfoundland that resulted in a court of appeal case called Follett. 
And in Follett, the video surveillance showed that every time that door creaked open, the men would break apart mm. because they were, I, I, I'm, to some extent, there is a, uh, I'm sure a kind of self-preservation that's involved with, with that. They don't want to get into a confrontation. They don't want to get arrested. But I also see that as a kind of an ethic of care, of uh, respect for non-participants, that people shouldn't be confronted with this if they don't want to see it. And so the, the practices of participants tends to reflect that. We are going to leave it there. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really great book. I really appreciate your time in the studio. Thank you for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.